Hey there, it's Internet Grandpa on the air again. We're here to read chapter 14 of the book Carry On Mr. Bowditch by Gene Lee Latham. Um, if you've been enjoying these, this book, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. I've enabled comments now. Um, I've taken this book out of the children's section and made it educational. Uh, the book, the readings that I'm doing for the two to five year olds, I'll leave as children's books. Uh, this is just the way YouTube works. Children's books, there, no comments are allowed. Well, children's channels are not allowed to have, uh, children's videos are not allowed to have comments. So, like, subscribe, and share, please. 19 Guns, Chapter 14. 19 Guns. Wonder what that's about. David and his crew all died of fever. Heartsick, Nate hurried to Mary's house. All the, way, all the way there, his thoughts were a jumble. What could he say to Mary? How could he comfort her? Maybe if I waited till after supper, he muttered, I could think of something to say. But he knew he was being a coward to tell himself that. He reached the house, tapped, and opened the door. Lois was there with Mary, helping Mary's little daughter read her New England primer. Mary saw Nate first. Nate, she came to meet him. Dear Nate, her lips trembled and her eyes filled with tears. For a moment, she leaned her forward forehead against his shoulder, hiding her face. If it hadn't been for you, Nate, I wouldn't have married David. I know, Nate admitted miserably. He'd been thinking of that himself. Did Dr. Bentley tell you I wanted to see you? Yes, Mary. I came right away. I wanted to say thank you, Nate. If it hadn't been for you, I would have missed being the happiest woman in Salem while David was here. She lifted her head. Her lips were steady now. She smiled slightly. Thank you, Nate. And now, will you do something for me? Anything I can. Sit down here and tell us all about your voyage, everything just as David used to when he came home. So I think Nate was expecting his sister to be upset with him for having encouraged her to marry David. But instead, she was grateful for having the time they had together. That's a good heart. So anyway, three hours later, supper was over. The dishes washed and Nate was still talking. Someone called, the door opened, and Elizabeth Boardman came in with her cousin, Mary Ingersoll, whom all the family called Polly. Elizabeth's eyes, violet eyes glowed. I heard you were here. Polly's level brown eyes danced with mischief. I think Elizabeth was just going to drop in to see Mary and pretend to be surprised when she saw you, but she was afraid I'd tell her, tell on her. Elizabeth blushed and laughed. Children, she said. Polly made a face. You're not so old. Sixteen, and I'm almost... Elizabeth laughed with Polly. She said, tell us all about everything, Nate. <coughs> Excuse me. Nate was solemn. I couldn't possibly. It's taken three hours to tell Mary and Lois, and I haven't gotten them off bourbon yet. Little girls shouldn't stay up that late. This time, Polly made a face at him. When father comes home, I stay up till all hours. Nate could imagine that. Polly's father was Captain Ingersoll, one of the most famous captains who sailed a derby ship. He told them about Bourbon and Captain Blanchard's Viva la Republique. At nine, he walked to the Boardman house with them and they went to see Dr. Bentley. Dr. Bentley talked late, bringing Nate up to date on the news of nations. Nate listened hungrily. He remembered how Habit once said, when you get home from a voyage, I feel as though I had been asleep for six months. So they don't hear any news about the world or the country when they're away on a voyage. Hmm. Affairs were in a miserable tangle, Dr. Bentley said. Things weren't settled with England yet. Americans were still fighting the Jay Treaty bitterly. English captains were still searching our vessels and seizing our, seizing our sailors, and the trouble with France grew more serious every day. I doubt if you'll be sailing soon again, Nate, 
at least not until the trouble with Francis settled. But a few days later, Dr. Derby called Nate and Captain Prince to his office and talked over another voyage. The ship is named Astria. He smiled slightly. I rather like that name. Nate thought of the earlier Astria, on which Captain John Derby had brought the news of peace from Paris. He remember how, remembered how proud he had been when his father said, Crowded sail he did, and came from Paris in 22 days. Mr. Derby seemed to be reading Nate's thoughts. The other Astria made a record for herself. I intend that this Astria should, shall set a record too. The first Salem ship ever to enter Manila Harbor. Ooh, that's in the Philippines, Manila. Manila, halfway around the world. Evidently, Nate decided Mr. Derby wasn't too concerned about the trouble with France. Mr. Derby went on in his quiet way. The Astria announced 19 guns, Captain Prince. If any of your crew has ever shipped on a privateer or a letter of mark ship, they uh, might be useful. Nate's scalp prickled. Captain Prince merely nodded. Any ports before Manila? Yes, you'll carry a mixed cargo to Lisbon and stop at Funchal in the Madeira Islands. Then on to Madilla. Madilla. <laughs> on to Manila. When Nate said, when Nate and Captain Prince left the office, Nate said, Manila, I wonder what language they talk there. The Spanish are the Prince started, stared at Nate. Don't, don't tell me you're gonna learn another language. Why not, sir? Prince pursed his lips and shook his head. Carry on, Mr. Bowditch. A few days later, Nate was ready to start learning Spanish. He had a dictionary, a grammar, and a New Testament. He opened the New Testament to the first chapter of John, and he repeated the words in English. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He looked up the Spanish. In el principio era el verbo, y el verbo era con Dios. E -E -L verbo era Dios. Nate smiled. Spanish, he decided, would be the e easiest language of all to learn. He could figure out every word in a sentence without a bit of trouble. Toward the last of March, Mary said, Do you have to sail Friday, Nate? Nate teased her. You're not superstitious about Friday, are you? Saturday's your birthday. If you do have to sail on Friday, I wish Nate saw the idea in the back of Mary's eyes. Oh, no, don't tell anyone that Saturday is my birthday. Why not? I wouldn't care for a celebration on board ship. Why? What would they do? Oh, well, something jolly like dunking me or pouring a few buckets of water on me. No celebration, please. Mary promised to keep his birthday a dark secret. Nate kissed her and went down to the wharf to see how the loading of the Astria was coming along. Should I let Putty read for a while? He seems interested in the book. <laughs> oh, you got your good putty. Yes, you are. Mr. Collins was on board and in a foul humor. You and your teaching, he growled. What's wrong with my teaching? We've lost four of the men we were counting on, inclu including Keeler. Nate grinned. Keeler was supposed to be a troublemaker, wasn't he? I'd think you'd be relieved. He was, Collins growled, but Keeler knew guns. Blast you and your teaching. Four good men all signed up as second mates on smaller vessels. Good for them, Collins glowed, glared. What about us? We'll just have to replace them. Sure, just like that. And do you know who is going to replace Keeler? Lem Harvey. Nate whistled. He knew Lem Harvey. A huge fellow with hulking shoulders and a sullen, swarthy face. He's kind of like the Hulk. Hulking shoulders, huh? A troublemaker if ever one lived. Why sign him on? Because, Collins growled, he sailed on privateers before he was knee-high to a capstan. He knows guns. If we have trouble with the French, he'll be worth the rest of the crew put together. And if we don't have trouble with the French, Nate asked, we'll have trouble with Lem. Personally, I'd rather have trouble with the French. A boy came aboard with a letter for Nate. Dear Nate, good luck on your voyage. When the Astria sails, I'm going to be on the captain's watch, watching you. Elizabeth. 
Early Friday morning, Nate strolled across the common toward the big white house and saw Elizabeth standing on the captain's walk. She waved and signaled that she'd come down. A few moments later, she came outside to meet him. You're shivering, Nate said. You're cold. I'm not cold, she whispered. I'm scared. Her violet eyes looked bigger than ever in her heart-shaped face. Nate, they have guns on the Astria. Why? Just so we won't have any trouble. If the French privateers see us, we'll look so dangerous the privateer will crowd sail and run. Elizabeth didn't smile. Nate, please take care of yourself. If you, if anything, suddenly she stood on tiptoe and kissed him, wheeled and fled into the house. Nate stared after her. Where are we at? Almost 11 minutes. Nate stared after her. He started to follow. He stopped. Nonsense, he told himself. She's just a child. Get on board your ship, Mr. Bowditch. He strode briskly toward the waterfront. And I'm going to pause this for now. And we'll finish the second half in a uh, separate video. Because these tend to run kind of long sometimes, I've been told. All right. Love you guys. We'll finish this second part a little later. You take care. Make sure you like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Maybe they'll like them too. Love you. Bye-bye.